Hello, and uh, welcome back to Medical and Veterinary Entomology. Today we are going to be looking at the systematics, behavior, and ecology of arthropods. This is part of Unit 1, and we will be concentrating on the uh, Blateria, the Theraptera, uh, Coleoptera, and Hemiptera. Uh, we will be looking at some structure, a lot of taxonomy, how taxonomy is organized in the arthropods, and then we'll briefly look at the different classes of our different families, I should say, of arthropods and their roles in medical and veterinary entomology. So in systematics, we have some type of um, organized grouping and classification. Uh, these organisms in systematics are, uh, they are organized based on common characteristics, uh, sometimes even called um, homology or homologous structures. So this would include their morphology, so their general shape. Uh, in cladistics, which is a form of systematics, uh, we would be looking at their genetics and degrees of uh, relationship, genetic relationships. And then through this, we can look at evolutionary divergence and development. So throughout the evolutionary tree and their evolutionary patterns, what do certain organisms or certain arthropods have in common? The idea of biosystematics is based on three basic principles. We first have to be able to establish some type of identification. Um, those identifications need to include some form of description. And then once all of that is completed, classification or categories, you could say, um, are created. So that's the idea behind systematics. The problem with uh, taxonomy and systematics is that it is constantly changing. New species are discovered, new relationships, new genetic uh, links and uh, commonalities. All classification is based on these kind of basic general levels that we have. But as we get more uh, in, the low, in the hierarchy of levels, when we get into genus and species, those are constantly changing because of new discoveries and um, new methods of classification that are being introduced. So. Uh, by the time I record this lecture and you guys listen to this lecture, there is some insect out there who has been taxonomically altered. So he's been, he or she has been switched from one taxon taxonomic category of classification to another. But what are the basic tenets of a classification? Uh, when we look at taxonomy, uh, we're looking at uh, similarities. So, of course, the fundamental unit of all living things is an individual or single organism. And we know that life has these levels of organization, right? We go from atoms to molecules, cells, tissue, organ, systems, organism, population, community, an ecosystem, and eventually a biosphere. We really start life at that cell level. So um, a true living organism can be a single-celled organism, such as a protozoan or a bacteria. And then the levels of organization go higher. So when we look at, unit, at, at units of living things, uh, taxonomy is where in, that, um, where in that hierarchy do these organisms fit? So just like we have these levels of organization for life in general, we have levels of organi organization for relationships between these organisms that are part of um, those ecosystems or communities. So this would be based on, um, for living organisms, would be based on the individual who is part of a population. The population makes up a community. The community makes up an ecosystem. Multiple ecosystems will make up a biosphere. So we start at that cell level. Some definitions uh, in systematics that you should be familiar with. Of course, an individual is a single organism, and a population is a group of individuals that interact with each other. If it's a species, then these individuals within the population that interact with each other are capable of successfully mating. So as long as um, it's a population of badgers, those badgers can mate and produce more badgers. But that doesn't mean that white-tailed deer aren't also part of that same population. It just depends on, uh, you're talking about a species within a population. Community is a group of individuals and or populations they're in the same ge geographic area. They interact with each other directly or indirectly, but they're all part of um, uh, multiple populations. So we're just getting into larger and larger populations. And then categories are when we group species and it's part of those groupings that uh, uh, in categories that we start our current taxonomic levels. So uh, 
family, class, genus, species, those sorts of things. So in our taxonomic levels, we have domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Most of you have taken um, identification courses, so you're very familiar with the levels of taxonomy. Uh, we have common names and we have, the, of course, the scientific names, which are oftentimes referred to as the Linnaeus classification. Linnaeus came up with the original levels of, ta of taxonomy. So oftentimes you will see at um, the end of a, uh, at the end of, of a, a genus species name, at the end of a species name, there'll be a upper lowercase l. Um, that epithet indicates that that taxonomy designation for that particular organism is based on the Linnaeus system. So the example here is the blue bottle fly, starts out domain Eukarya, kingdom Animalia, phylum Arthropoda, class Insecta, order Diptera, family Califoridae, genus uh, Califora, and then species Vomitora. And the blue bottle fly, which is the common name, um, is uh, oftentimes associated with uh, cadavers and, and dead, dead organisms. Now, one of the things to remember in this particular class, one of our ultimate goals is many of you may be going out into public service, into public world, into the, the uh, public service fields. And if you are, you're not going to walk around and say, oh, the California vomitora. You're going to say blue bottle fly. So in this class, we do use a lot of common names as opposed to scientific names. We'll start out with the scientific name and let you know what it is. But then more often than not, we will talk about it in terms of its common name. So nomenclature, um, we have those common names, right? Genus, species, epithet is the formal name of organisms, um, like such as diptera are oftentimes more commonly known as the true flies, whereas hemiptera are often referred to as the true bugs. So we have our scientific epithet, and then we have, of course, the, the common name. Other categories can be used um, that are in between, and this is where in arthropods uh, especially you see a lot of these subgroups. So we see subclasses, subgenus, suborder, lots of in-betweens to help distinguish minor characteristic differences or commonalities between two different uh, species of the same organism. Uh, vectors, uh, we're going to be look at looking at vectors that fall under the order of arthropod. There are some vectors of disease that may fall uh, under arachnids and we'll mention those uh, they're more of a nuisance or pain type thing as opposed to spreading disease, but we will talk about them a little bit. Uh, we're going to just talk about their general feeding behavior because remember from the lecture on vectoral capacity and competence that their feeding behavior plays a really big role in their ability to uh, transmit disease. What environment these organisms are found in is important and also different larval stages. Uh, larval stages become important because they are uh, part of the control cycle. So controlling mosquito larvae, it's a lot easier to control some of these vectors at a larval level or early in the life cycle as opposed to later. It's a lot easier to treat a pond than adult mosquitoes. Finally, we're going to look at what role they play as a vector of disease, what diseases they're spreading, some of the signs and symptoms and immunological reactions to those diseases, how we might control that vector, um, and the role of uh, the vector itself in the life cycle of the actual pathogen that they are transmitting. So we're just going to kind of go through the arthropods here real quick. Uh, many of the ones that we're going to talk about in this particular lecture, many of these classes do not uh, are not involved in transmitting diseases, but they are part of the arthropods, so we need to mention them. Uh, the columbolas are your common springtails. No known disease transmission at this time. Uh, sometimes they're confused with fleas. They're very, very small. Usually they're uh, m even smaller than fleas. Most people have never really seen them. They're found mostly in soil and they help to, they're part of the decomposition process. Uh, they do consume bacteria, fungi, other microscopic organisms. And they're in, one of the problems they have is in some farm areas in the agricultural world, they are, they do like to eat roots. They feed on the small root hairs and can cause uh, loss of production uh, in, in agriculture. Thysanura are your silverfish or fire brats. These are oftentimes the silverfish are sometimes found in drawers, old drawers. They, they like paper, those kinds of things. 
They're found worldwide. They're found in sandy soil. Most of the time they're consuming leaf matter or fungus. Fire brats are similar, Ooh. Um, but they prefer warmer areas. So they're sometimes found near furnaces or fire pits, hence the name, the common name fire brat, because they like things kind of hot. The odonata are your dragonflies and damselflies. They're um, one of the more beautiful uh, arthropods out there. They also are distributed worldwide. They will consume smaller insects. Uh, they are used as a form of biological control for mosquitoes. Um, you can oftentimes use them also as a bioindicator for the health of, a, uh, of an environment or an ecosystem. When they're present in large populations, that usually indicates that the ecosystem that you're looking at is actually very healthy. Uh, dragonflies are sensitive to pollution and um, poor, quality, poor water quality conditions. So if the water's bad, it's uh, uh, stagnant or contaminated or um, there's dumping, things like that, the dragonfly or damselfly population will be, uh, will be low or absent. They can bite. Uh, they don't sting. They don't have stingers, but they do bite. And the bite, if they're a large one, can actually draw blood. I was actually bit on the nose by a dragonfly one time, and it was quite painful. Um, there's usually some swelling and, and inflammation because of an immune reaction, but they are not known to harbor any disease. And my apologies for the, uh, for the typos there. The ephemeroptera are your mayflies. Uh, they also have a worldwide distribution. They consume bacteria. They kind of like skim the surface of water and rocks and some weeds. They just kind of whatever opportunity they can get. They tend to swarm and you'll see just huge swarms of them for a very short period of time. But they are very important to the health of ecosystems and they are beneficial as a food source for many. When they're in nymph form, which is the picture on the bottom, uh, they're a common food source for many uh, many fish and aquatic organisms. If you ever go fly fishing, uh, mayflies are a common lure that are used in fly fishing, both in nymph form and in um, adult form. Uh, Pocoptera and Phasmida, this is your stoneflies. Uh, we don't really have them here in Florida. They like a little bit cooler. Um, uh, sometimes they can feed on mayfly nymphs. They like to be near fast moving water. They like the water to be highly oxygen because their nymphs require very high oxygen levels. Um, and they are also used as bioindicators for ecosystem health. Uh, they don't bite, they don't let toxins or anything, so there's no disease transmission. And the phas phasmida, we have the walking stick and leaf insect. These guys are masters at disguise. Uh, they are herbivorous and they live in trees and shrubs. Orthoptera, the grasshoppers, crickets, katydids, and locusts. They are worldwide distribution except in areas of extreme cold. So we don't see them in the Antarctic or the Arctic or up in Alaska or anything like that. They are plant feeders and they're the biggest problem with these guys is they have huge agricultural impacts. Locusts will swarm in big giant black clouds, just millions of them all at once. And they can literally mow down an entire cornfield, acres and acres, hundreds of acres of a, of a cornfield in a matter of 24 hours. Uh, they're found in uh, wheat grasses and wooded areas. They exist in the egg nymph in adult form. Uh, they are not a vector of disease, but they do have major, major agricultural impacts financially. They can wipe out entire crops, which can in turn alter the food chain and it alters prices and all kinds of stuff. So they can do some big damage. Uh, the Dermaptera are the earwigs. Uh, we have earwigs here in Florida. They are found in, in warmer climates. They're pretty common down here. They break down, they're part of the breakdown process or decomposition. Uh, there are a few species out there that are carnivorous and eat other insects, uh, uh, but they do, they're used primarily to control soil organisms. No known vector of disease, no disease is known from these guys. The Isoptera and Bladidea are not disease causing, right? They do not transmit disease. We're talking about the Isoptera here, the termites. However, they are economically one of the most impactful uh, arthropods out there uh, with the exception of a few disease factors. And that is because they are termites. They do massive damage to housing and buildings and uh, trees and forests. They feed on wood. 
they have a symb that symbiotic relationship with bacteria, the, the flagellates in their guts. Uh, they are found all over the world. They're a major problem here in Florida. We do see a lot of them here and they also swarm. So you can see up at the top here, she's got these big long flat wings, uh, this one here, and these guys just fly in these huge swarms and gain entry into eaves in parts of homes where the wood has been damaged. And you can see all of this damage right here is termite damage. So these guys, they get in maybe through these vents and then they move up into this wood and just eat their way around it. Again, here a house, they tore out the drywall and such, and this is a close up here of the termite nymphs that are uh, feeding on this wood here. So this is all termite damage. Notice there's none in the brick down here. It's just all up here in the wood. The blatteria are your cockroaches. Um, they call Now they call them the blatidias. Uh, also worldwide distribution. And these guys are omnivorous. So they will eat other insects, including other cockroaches oftentimes. Um, and they will also eat plant material. They don't necessarily transmit disease, but they're uh, considered a nuisance. They're usually associated with poor living conditions. They're looking for water most of the time, um, but they're also looking for food. So leaving food out and those sorts of things will often tr attract them. Uh, uh, they can transmit disease through mechanical transmission. So you have uh, food, rotting food or um, sewage, those sorts of things that may be laying around. If they come into contact with it, then uh, if they come over to food that you may be eating or you come into contact with them, you can sometimes pick up bacteria that they picked up, but through, they don't eat or they don't, they're not blood feeders. So there would be no d direct disease transmission. Um, nymphs of some species will actually create these kind of defensive like chemical compounds on, on their, their hind ends. And some people are actually sensitive to it. So if there's a large population um, of these cockroaches in, in the house or in, in a building, if the nymphs are producing this toxin, right, on their turgites, there, it can actually give, cause an allergic reaction. So some people have really strong allergic reactions to those toxins, and they also create a lot of dust. Uh, the wings and the exoskeleton as insects die and they break down, people oftentimes have some allergies to those as well. So they can, they're associated with allergic reactions, but they don't, and some indirect bacterial transmission, but that's about it. So how these cockroaches are associated with disease, here's on the left, here's a list of some of, of the different organisms that they transmit. And majority of these, with the exception of a few, are uh, bacterial diseases. They get spread mostly through fecal, fecal matter. Uh, if the cockroach consumes food that contains these bacterial organisms on it, it's believed that some of those organisms can actually survive through the... Um, through the lumen and the gut of the, the cockroach and then be deposited through feces onto food as well. So salmonella, uh, what's called bacillary dysentery, which is uh, just basically bacterial dysentery, uh, plague, which is kind of an interesting one, typhoid fever, cholera, these are all bacterial diseases, leprosy, uh, polio is viral, and then parasitic worms. Um, if a uh, host infected, someone infected, has a, a, a worm infection with gastrointestinal worms. Eggs are usually deposited in feces, so they'll be expelled from the host for another host to come into contact with them and take them up. So if these cockroaches are consuming these eggs or consuming feces, they're running around on feces from somebody who has a worm infection, hookworm, tapeworm, roundworm, uh, those eggs can be consumed and then picked up by someone else. Cockroach debris is believed to actually be the biggest aggravator of allergies. Um, anatomically, they're not really as good at the bacterial transmission as flies, but um, it is still considered. So I want you to take a look over here at the top here. We have the leg of a cockroach. And you can see on the tibia and the femur, we have these little hair-like structures. And these little hair-like structures, bacteria will stick to them, particularly along the femur. Uh, but they'll stick to these little hair-like structures and they sometimes will stick down here in the tarsus. On flies, you can see that those hair-like structures are much longer. They're more fringe-like. Um, the femur has more of them. They also move further up on the body and they go all the way down the tarsi to the um, pretarsus. So they actually are covered with these hair-like structures and they're sticky. 
and it causes bacteria to stick to them. So flies are much better mechanical transmitters of disease than cockroaches, but there are some similarities and cockroaches are capable of doing that. Uh, here we have the praying mantids, the mantidia. Uh, mantids are carnivorous organisms um, and they're opportunistic feeders, but they do not feed on humans. They're found in warm temperature or warmer climates. They're not, um, again, not associated with disease and sometimes they're actually used as a pet. So coptera, these are the bark and book lice. And then we have the theraptera, which are the chewing and sucking lice. Uh, in some groups of taxonomists, they keep them together, and in other groups, they separate them. Uh, for all intents and purposes in this class, we're going to se separate the two of them, and that's because the Socoptera are not associated with disease. Um, bark lice, uh, they're found in woods. Of course, book lice, they like cellulose, so the binding, the glue that's used to bind books is oftentimes what book lice are actually feeding on. Uh, they are found throughout the world, but book lice are more of a nuisance in libraries and people's homes, uh, but they're not really medically important. The Theraptera, on the other hand, these are the lice, and they are blood feeders. So there are two suborders of uh, Theraptera, the Malophaga and the Anaplura. The Malophagas are the chewing lice, and the Anapleras are sucking lice. There are some taxonomists that will take these two suborders uh, take the two orders with four sub suborders. We're going to just stick with two, right? So we're going to stick with Malophaga and Anaplura. They are found worldwide. They are a very common ectoparasite of birds, in particular, and uh, wild mammals, but mostly birds. They cause a lot of damage. They can um, they are blood feeders. So through biting, sucking, they uh, can cause physical damage. They can also transmit disease because of that blood feeding behavior. So when we compare chewing and sucking lice, you want to make sure that you see the difference. Here in the Malophaga, the chewing lice, you can see the head is really big. The thorax is quite large. Um, and uh, we can see these antenna sticking out here. So it's a very big organism. We also see in the thorax this uh, big striping. And um, they have this kind of outline here on the outside of the thorax. And the sucking lice, the head is very narrow. Uh, we can see uh, these legs are much more prominent. The thorax has these hair-like structures, and it's more, uh, more opaque. It doesn't have the black lining, black lines on the ends, uh, and it's a little bit smaller overall. Uh, the head is narrower than the thorax, and if the head is broader than the thorax, you can see here, right? So the head is broader than the thorax, and here the head is narrower than the thorax. So your chewing lice, big head, your sucking lice little head. I always think of the head in sucking lice as a straw that you would suck through. That's how I remember them. So the anaplura are the, the sucking lice. These are that ectoparasite in birds and uh, mammals. Uh, they will not survive off of their, ho off of their host. So uh, they are only going to be able to survive as long as they're attached to you. The chewing lice are the ones that are of the most human medical importance. And in the chewing lice, uh, the uh, head louse, the body louse, and then the pubic louse. Uh, the head lice, uh, they're not associated with disease, but of course they're a major, uh, major nuisance and kids get sent home and you have to use the special shampoo and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the body lice is known to transmit typhus, typhoid fever, trench fever, relapsing fever. We'll discuss these more in later lectures, but... Um, they definitely transmit some pretty bad diseases. Pubic lice are not considered uh, disease transmitters, but they can cause damage. They can cause physical damage. They can cause scabbing, uh, itching, sometimes referred to as crabs. It is also considered a sexually transmitted disease since they live mainly in the pubic area. Uh, secondary itching. So secondary infections can can occur because of the pediculitis itching, and uh, that's the 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 lice um, biting and the saliva, when they inject saliva, it causes itching. Some people have a, a minor allergic reaction and the inflammatory conditions cause massive itching. So if somebody's scratching it like crazy, they're gonna break the skin and they can possibly introduce secondary infection with bacteria. In the Malophaga, these chewing lice, um, we see them in animals the, uh, as a, 
in addition to humans, there are several different species of lice that are transmitted onto cattle. Uh, there's two species that infect uh, horses. Uh, sheep can get them. Again, irritation, scabbing, itching, more nuisance. In really severe infestations, you can actually have major blood loss. Uh, calves and uh, young sheep, young horses, foals can be at risk if, they have, if there are very heavy infestations of lice because of just the massive blood loss. And if the, if the calf is that infected, the mother is likely uh, very infected as well. And if she's covered, she can actually um, have a loss of milk production. Uh, that can be an economic issue for a dairy farmer or it can be a survival issue for a, a small calf. So those are the major orders of the arthropods that we're going to be looking at in here. Uh, uh, just kind of a quick overview. Uh, and um, uh, that's the end of this slideshow. So uh, just kind of review these different organisms. You'll see a few questions about them on exam one, whether they transmit disease or not. And those that do, what diseases do they transmit? Are secondary infections possible? Are they blood feeding or not blood feeding? Being able to recognize chewing versus sucking lice, just some pretty uh, common sense types of questions.